Hello friends, I am Ardhendu De. You are watching ADC English Literature. Here, we will consider Ulysses as a typical Victorian poem. We will also see how Tennyson uses the figure of the legendary hero Ulysses as the representative of Victorian times and try to analyze how far it would be true to say that Tennyson's Ulysses expresses a kind of vital energy, a kind of resolution of the Victorian times. But first of all, a few words on Lord Tennyson as a poet. Tennyson, a great literary titan, is often told the representative poet of Victorian age and it is his poetry that mirrors the most vital problem of industrial and moral life. A kind of religious doubts, social problems, everything is there. A kind of culture, uh, that, that mindset that uh, is inherently shows a kind of corrupt society, a pride far flung of the empire, the spirit of the compromise, so characteristics of the Victorian period is all uh, uh, exhibited in Tennysonian poetry. Tennyson, a poet laureate, used verse to promote the Victorian empire. It is not untrue to say that uh, Tennyson's popularity is all a projection, uh, more extravagant projection uh, than that of rest of the poets, but his Ulysses is one of the most uh, widely popular and most anticipating a concept of imperialism. I mean the expansion of empires is there, but it is typically and much an anthologized poem of his. The expansion of knowledge, the expansion of experience, a kind of a uh, a robust zeal to see the unseen, to know the unknown is all uh, in Ulysses and this kind of poem is itself epoch making in Tennysonian identity. But we cannot ignore Arnold and Browning of his time. Oedipus in Greek legend is a Greek hero that we all know. Uh, the ruler of the island of Ithaca and one of the leaders of the Greek army during the Trojan War. Homer's Ulysses recounts Odysseus adventures and ultimate return home 10 years after the fall of Troy. I, I know that you are a little bit familiar with Iliad and Odyssey story. So initially, Odysseus was mentioned as the son of Laertes, king of Ithaca, although in the other literary references in later traditions of Sisyphus, the king of Corinth was considered uh, his real father, his mother uh, having later married Laertes after the death of her first husband. Throughout the Iliad poem by Homer, he is portrayed as a brave, sagacious, cunning warrior. And he is awarded the famous armor of the Achilles after the former's death. In the Odyssey, it is said that he proposed the stratagem of the Trojan horse, uh, the means by which Troy was conquered. In the works of the later classical features in classical writers, in fact, particularly those of the Greek poet like Pindar and the Greek playwright Euripides uh, and the romantic poet Virgil too, we can find out that Ulysses is more cunning and his characteristics is often cowardly drawn and politics that he displays is uh, not the matter of such valiant but here we can find out a kind of a admixture of Homeric as well as Pindaric traditions. In Latin his name is rendered as Ulysses. So the subject of Ulysses is quite popular in Greek legends and is popular fascinating character 
in romantic ages in in, in classical ages as well as in victorian ages Tennyson himself said that Ulysses which was written shortly after Hallam's death his friend Arthur Henry Hallam so uh, it gave a kind of feeling about a kind of a, a kind of uh, a need of going forward a braving the struggle of life perhaps more simply than anything in in memoriam that he has written in 1850 so this kind of ulysses or the type of poem is an escape route to uh, lead the life uh, which tennyson exposes his inner thoughts that the monotony or the rather boredom that he has acquired due to his uh, untimely loss of his friend this kind of poem is a kind, is an expression of his uh, getting himself or setting himself free from the clutch of monotony or the clutch of morrows and sorrows his other poem lotus eater is also on the subject of ulysses return uh, to ithaca this particular poem ulysses embodies the modern passion of knowledge for knowledge for the exploration of its limitless field for the annexation of new kingdom of science and thoughts so these are all the kind of victorian expansion this is, is a kind of poem which is a kind of escape route um, or a kind of expansion uh, if not Im imperially it, it might be said that it's an expansion of knowledge of thought of new gamut of understanding this ulysses, ulysses is a poem of blank verse written in 1833 and it was published in 1842 this poem is very up quoted and most popular and the kind of example of this poem is dramatic monologue you know what the dramatic monologue is we, we are not going to analyze the dramatic monologue but here you can find out a kind of a speech a, a, a solo speech by ulysses addressing his sellers or addressing oneself uh, only we get the revelation of his inner thoughts so here the spirit of the heroic adventure uh, in the primitive world and the those and whose manhood was spent in 20 years war travel uh, he wants to uh, break away from the monotonous inactivity of life uh, on the small island of Ithaca where he is a king and he fares forth again as a sea rover because he is most accustomed to do uh, re braving the unknown knowing the unknown as well as experiencing the unexperienced the poem is an interesting reading ulysses delivers his monologue at ithaca after his return from the trojan war he is at present bored and willing to set himself free from the domestic activities, from the monotonous domestic activities or domestic chains. It little profits that an idle king by this steel heart among these barren crags matched with an aged wife I mate and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and slave and paid and know not me so these particular lines of ulysses that begins with he instantly tells the fellow listeners that it little profits what the profit margin is for ulysses for ulysses the profit of life is gaining the new experiences knowing the unknown braving the unseen or daring the dark so here ulysses is a positive personage of the victorian era in which the expansion of not the geographical land but also the mental sphere is also is in talking here tennyson's ulysses is not the lover of public affairs seen in homer's poem ulysses finds the meaninglessness of life which he has been enjoying in his hilly kingdom in the company of old wife or 
ruling over the savage people who do not even know him. So he is not at all ready to get harrowed by those earthly belongings or the family affairs or the affairs of statesmanship. So 20 years later when Ulysses the king of Ithaca returned home from Trojan war, what is his in front of him? Whereas all the other activities, erstwhile activities were full of life, he finds now a static, a kind of lagoon. He spent in fact much of his time on the battlefields of Troy and in the rough seas. Ulysses however returned home with great experiences but with a kind of impatience. He is now a kind of disappointed at the present state of affairs. So what is the present state of affairs he is facing? Confronted again by domestic life, you know, a, a great hero who had been a name in Trojan War is now doing the simple affairs of king, kingmanship or in the steadily affairs. He is a, a kind of a personage who is indifferent towards the savage race. Um, the savage race obviously are the subjects of Ithaca. Ulysses contrasts his present restlessness with his heroic past. With the experience of living an adventurous life, the semi-civilized subjects are not very um, well welcome aspects for him or well resorts for him. He does not like the rule or the company of the old woman. Obviously here he refers his wife. So he is not to be carried by family appears. The disappointed Ulysses here mm. says that his, his, his countrymen are not appreciating his true quality. They only hold, they sleep, they feed. It equals a kind of Hamlet's soliloquy. What is a man? If his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed a beast no more? I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. Here Ulysses' emphatic statement is that he is a drunkard, drunkard of the mirth of life. He wants to drink life to the lees as a typical Victorian would have done. So Ulysses decided to sell the unknown to the unknown sea for the last time because he liked to sing a swan song. He wants to drink wine to the end like that of a drunkard, the last drop of wine. So the mirth of life, he want to quench the very thrust of living. Simply Ulysses wants the mirth of life. He wants to enjoy the intoxication of living a life, a full of vitality, full of energy, full of pivotal points of seeing the unseen, knowing the unknown. Again he says, All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone on shore, and when through scarring drifts the rainy heads vex the dim sea. Ulysses does not want to stop selling. He had to deal with various disasters while traveling by sea. So Ulysses erstwhile endeavors his heroic pursuits into the various disasters en route to travel, en route to returning from Troy to Ithaca. These all are the very paths of Ulysses' lifestyle. Whenever he had the uh, pursuits of new lands, new navigation, new voyage, he had 
the opportunity to notice the different kind of things, different kind of countries, race and customs. And these are the very desire of Ulysses. Navigating through the paths of Anna, scudding drifts, these are pounding rain showers encountered at the sea during a storm or while crabbing off the Alaskan coast. So these are the reference. The Hades are a group of stars in the constellation of Taurus that are often associated with rain. Their rise in the sky generally coincides with the rainy season. So here Ulysses does not want a piece of navigation through uh, so beautiful affordable atmosphere rather he wants adventure. So adventurous Ulysses always willing to navigate through into the dark unknown unseen ocean. Again he says I am become a name for always roaming with a hungry heart much have I seen and known cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all. These are the emphatic statement of Ulysses of knowing the unknown. Again he says, and drunk delight of battle with my peers, far on the ringing plains of in Detroit, he, the Ulysses, is famous everywhere today. His life is rich in diverse experiences, including the experiences of fighting on the battlefield with his peers. He has seen a lot, faced many dangers with courage, learned a lot and thus gained a lot of geological knowledge. The Trojan War was so huge as it has been described by Homer. The plains or the battlefields are ringing because of the armors clashing. So the valiant kind of war he has participated. They fought there with the great heroes in together. So both in battle, both in adventure, both in style of living a life was not restricted but unrestrained a kind of full vigor of life. So such a Ulysses can ever be entrapped within the domestic atmosphere. So Ulysses this kind of monologue is a robust will of knowing the unknown, seeing the unseen, navigating through dark, navigating through rains, clouds. Again, Ulysses says, I am a part of all I have met. Yet all experiences is an arch had through glimpse that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unvarnished, not to sign in use. Ulysses has seen much and known much, but it is not satisfied with what he gained. This is the typical Victorian aspects in Ulysses. Ulysses, like that of a ever expanding emperor, willing to expand his kingdom, but here was of knowledge. His experiences is an arch out of the house of life to look beyond, at ever widening horizon, unknown regions are always inviting him to travel beyond. This experience is a preparation for trip to an undisclosed area. For him as to the Victorian, the quest, the query is the key. A life of indolence is no more than death. It is a life in death, in fact. 
a life of rest from all these kind of toils and moils is not desired by Ulysses. The adventurous spirit in fact in Ulysses does not allow him to pause because pause is a kind of an end. If you don't burnish yourself, it would get rusted. If you don't use something, it will lose its sign. The unquenchable desire seized Ulysses. And if that spirit is dead, he will be rusted. As though to breathe where life, life piled on life, we are all too little and of one to me little remains but every hour is saved from that eternal silence something more a bringer of new things and while it were for some three sons to store and hold myself and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. Why the endless store of knowledge in one life even if you add a few lives will not be mastered. So according to Ulysses, his lifespan is only a few years because he is at the dying age. So he will devote every moment of his life to the pursuit of knowledge. That will satisfy him. Ulysses is willing to navigate through life with the help of inquisitive mindset. That mindset is the key. That mindset is the typical Victorian mindset. To follow the sinking star. It means an endless journey. It is commonly known that art is long, life short. In this dramatic line, Tennyson also has given a poetical expression to this artistic desire, a kind of philosophy. He has added that in spite of this handicap, see, man must continue the quest for more and more and more and more knowledge till he remain alive. So this kind of persuasion is the key, key to living. A life without that quest, without that persuasion is like that of a death. That's the Ulysses point of view. Now Ulysses directly refers to his son Telemachus. This is my son, my own Telemachus, to whom I leave the spectra and the eyes of well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and to the good. Most blameless is he centered in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and pay meet adoration to my household gods. When I am gone, he walks his, his beloved work. son Telemachus was I mind, tolerant and prudent in worldly affairs and worldly matters. He is accustomed to do ordinary things in a very um, prudent way. In his absence, this Telemachus will be able to patiently work to make the barbaric countrymen civilized and he will continue to worship the household gods and uh, the so-called domestic duties he should accomplish with devotion. But these staffs are not accustomed to Ulysses' persona and these conventional activities are not truly intended for Ulysses. So he wants to hand over the specter, the responsibility of governing the state to Telemachus. 
he then says there lies the port the vessel puffs are sail there gloom the dark board seas by mariners souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me so here the direct references is there to his mariners that the ports are calling so as the sails so these are the part for the whole it refers to all the ports seeds where he has designed to make a new journey ahead and he addresses his sailors to get ready for the new voyage that ever with a frolic welcome to the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts free foreheads from our discussion you get the points that ulysses has reached the evening of life he sees in front of him ships are get, getting ready for his last voyage ulysses exhorted his old colleagues here he is beckoning them and how he addresses his old sailors they have faced all kind of problems in time of danger happiness sorrow the phrase opposed free hearts free foreheads is a little trick now ulysses means that his sailors opposed whatever came in their way thunder for example they did it as free men with a lot of confidence so here the sailors like ulysses own persona has been free from any sort of obstacles of any ideological bondages so this freeness is the freeness of the will by which they can navigate through the unknown and unseen all the restrictions of nations domesticality will not hinder them now again he addresses that you and i are old old age hath yet his honor and his toil death closes all but something at the end some walk of noble note may yet be done not unbecoming men that strove with gods not unbecoming is double negative to mean they are becoming men who fought with the gods against evils for the sake of good in other words they were always on ethically right side and hence always god like and heroic so these are the valiant words that have been uttered only to um, cheer up the old sailors like that of ulysses old age the light begin to twinkle from the rocks the long way winds the slow moon climbs the deep morns round with many voices come my friends it is not too late to seek a newer world who saw and sitting well in order smite sounding furrows what my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths and the paths of all the western stars until it die it may be that the gulfs will wash us down it may be we shall touch the happy hours and see the great achilles whom we knew the sea expedition that crosses the age of our familiar earth its aim is unknown huge waves of sea can take us to the abyss during the voyage the main greek hero achilles may be met on the island of blazed happy isle um, it is said that uh, the greek heroes after death find a place on this beautiful paradise a special island that uh, is not in the heaven or hell but in this happy island all the heroes reside so ulysses realizes that he and his companions might die but they will meet a heroic death 
if they die they might even get to go to the happy hours and visit their old paul achilles even as we get older our courage our determination have not diminished yet we are what we wear in our minds mind is the key we will continue to strive with that passion for new discoveries without giving up so these are the robust will that comes handy to cheer up his mariners though march is taken march abides and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved the earth and heaven that which we are we are one equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate but strong in will to strive to seek to find and not to yield ulysses energy is inexhaustible man's life is short to ulysses a little of life is left but old age does not mean for him the end of life to strive to seek to find not to yield are ought to be ever remembered as even in old age some work of noble note may yet be done that's the very philosophic words he utters till one's death every hour should be spent actively it may prove a bringer of new things this guiding principles for life is typically tennisonian and basically victorian in tone we must remember that 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 in whole of the piece the poem is tennison's philosophy of continued action adventure is the true spirit of life that is the very tagline of this entity of ulysses message to his mariners the high spirit energy and resolution of the victorian age are fully celebrated in ulysses ulysses wishes to grasp the unattainable and the infinite with his old mariners he is extremely eager to go out a new voyage in search of undiscovered shore and fresh adventure the persuasion of knowledge is also there knowing the unknown where is the goal of ulysses to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until i die it is true that though the mariners are not in full physical mirth the strength of the youngs are gone as ulysses is growing old so as his fellow mariners though they are made weak by time and fate but they have the will inside their heart and the determination to touch the unknown shore to touch the untouchable is the very spirit that ulysses here celebrates some ways of hellenic life come into focus in this poem ulysses the poem is a beautiful study of the greek atmosphere in the times of the trojan war the spirit is homeric the people of the ithaca are naturally savage barbarous uncivilized their interest in in material materialistic prosperity makes them unable to appreciate the heroic prosperity and the adventurous curious spirit of ulysses the poem also mirrors the greeks respect for their household gods and their carefulness in paying true tribute to them household deities were worshiped in proper care and attention the failure of doing so is a kind of failure of being loyal of a greek citizen the failure to adore them was a kind of moral lapse you know ulysses praised his son for praying the household gods praying tribute to his household gods and doing the duties but ulysses is kind of a a person of free will but 
one thing also to be remembered in whole of the poem that the poem is a vivid word picture you know the brilliant picture of evening landscape of Ithaca can be visualized here through the lines light being twinkled from the rock the long day winds the slow moon climbs the deep ones round with many voices so these are the lines which celebrate the very picture of Ithaca Tennyson's Ulysses is a superb creation of artistic excellence with a kind of Keatsian pictorial quality and his astonishing command of musical resources of language is blended here accurately and the poem itself becomes a landmark. It expresses a kind of philosophy which is of Tennyson's, the Victorian Tennyson's, the energy, the resolution of his time, the Victorian time. Tennyson's Ulysses is a projection of kind of Victorian empire. We cannot miss the point that whatever the fallacy, whatever the shortcomings are there in Victorian age is also being elaborately stated in Ulysses. Uh, in reference, I can say the Lotus Eaters, the other poem, the same hero Ulysses is there. The greatest Greek hero uh, who fought in the Trojan War, we know Ulysses is also making a philosophical point, a continued action is being uh, or a kind of optimism and hope is also being celebrated in another poem, The Lotus Eater. In a dramatic way, Ulysses here inspires and stimulates us for ceaseless hard work. Continuity is the very point here stated. The Lotus Eaters exhibits a voyage to oblivion, far from the active din and bustle of life. But here, in this poem, Ulysses, an escapism from the wander over the sea and adventure is the very spirit. So, you can read this poem, Ulysses, along with another dramatic monologue that I refer, the Lotus Eaters. Though the, there are different moods of life, tireless journey of rest, these are the themes as well as uh, both these poems simultaneously enrich the point of Victorian study as well as Tennysonian study. I think uh, in this class you can have different points, different ideologies, different techniques. So I say this little bit of class will help you to understand the poem Ulysses in better way. You can study this poem in competition with the Lotus Eaters along with different questions that I like to share in this screen. You can have the parallel ideologies, parallel conception of reading this poem. And one thing you must remember that while reading the Tennyson, you must understand that one point or two point are being stated repeatedly in the lines of Ulysses. For from, from very dramatic point of view, this poem cannot have that kind of dramatic in intensity as well as psychological insight as that of Browning. But nonetheless, the legendary hero Ulysses is being truly represented here uh, as, 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 as from the spirit of Tennysonian um, ideologies. We can read Ulysses in a new light here. So with that perception, I say you can continue these studies and if there is any question that pop up in your mind, just feel free to ask me. I will try my best to give some answers. So like, share, comment and obviously subscribe to my channel. Bye-bye. Thank you.